Hey, what's up guys, Matt with The Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk about concurrent training, or said another way, how to maximize strength, hypertrophy, and endurance gains at the same time. I've done a thorough research review on the science of concurrent training for this video, and summarized everything into four main points of what you can do with your program design to maximize the concurrent training adaptations. So you've probably noticed there's a spectrum of gym goers, and on one side we have bodybuilders or powerlifters who are trying to maximize strength and hypertrophy. And then on the other end you have people like me who are recreational endurance athletes who will train for months to swim in a nearly dried up lake with a bunch of hungover dads for a small prize like this mug. And then there's people in the middle who want a little bit of both. They want the endurance training adaptations, but they also want to be big and strong and powerful, so they want the strength and hypertrophy adaptations as well. And that's where concurrent training comes into play. So let's dive into the first way to maximize concurrent training adaptations. And that is number one, to perform high intensity endurance training early in the day and then resistance training later in the day. Ideally, we want this to be separated by at least three hours and ideally close to four to six hours. For example, doing your endurance training around six to seven a.m. and then going back to the gym around maybe two or three p.m. for your resistance training. Now this isn't very practical for a lot of people, but it would be optimal if you can separate this out specifically because of the molecular pathways associated with anabolic and catabolic responses. For example, endurance training tends to peak what's called AMPK. What we need to know about AMPK is that it's basically catabolic and it reduces cell growth and proliferation. This tends to be attenuated about three hours after endurance training. So if we can wait at least three hours after endurance training before we start our resistance training, we get a better response from that resistance training. Following resistance training, we actually have a different anabolic stimulus. And along with things like growth hormone and testosterone that you're more familiar with, we have a growth pathway led by mTOR, which tends to last around 18 hours after resistance training. This is why it's typically recommended that we do the endurance training first, early, wait a few hours, and then do the resistance training, and give a fairly long time period after resistance training for those adaptations like muscle protein synthesis to occur. So this isn't gonna be possible for everybody, but if we can separate our endurance and resistance training into different days, or at least separate them by three hours with the endurance training being first, that's probably gonna be the optimal way to do concurrent training to get the best adaptations from both. Number two, we have a nutrition recommendation, and that is to consume leucine-rich protein after resistance training. This is a good recommendation for anyone concurrent training or strength training or endurance training at all, but it's specifically beneficial for concurrent training because recovery is such a big piece of being able to do both endurance training and resistance training without interference. If we can specifically consume protein close to the end of our resistance training session and also prior to going to sleep at night, then that's going to maximize our muscle protein response and allow us to recover well and be able to perform that endurance training without a significant interference effect. Now that said, we do have to consider how much endurance training we can really do before we start to see an interference effect because it is related to both volume and intensity. So even if your nutrition's dialed in right and you're maximizing the timing window and the other things that we're gonna talk about, you still may run into the interference effect if you do too much endurance training or too intensive endurance training. I'll link to a bunch of studies that are reviewed below. We're not gonna get into the individual study protocols, but I will tell you the conclusions of a few different studies so that way we can start to draw a line about where we start to see an interference effect. For example, one study showed that cycling two times a week for 30 minutes below lactate threshold did not have a significant interference effect. So that's probably actually pretty far below the line of where we're gonna to start to see an interference effect. Another protocol that was tested was three days a week of endurance training for 50 minutes at 70% of VO2 max. So this is still roughly below or right around the lactate threshold three times a week for 50 minutes, and that study did not show a significant interference effect. However, another study that did a similar volume but four days a week, 80% intensity, did show a significant interference effect and reduced strength training adaptations from adding four days a week, 80% of VO2 max endurance training. So that's a pretty substantial volume and intensity and it probably started to result in the athletes not being able to recover well from the resistance training and also be able to handle all this endurance training. So that line actually may be different for each individual. Individuals with a good resistance training and endurance training history may be able to handle more. Less well-trained individuals may be able to handle less, but at least seeing a couple different study protocols and what tends to work for the average person might give you an idea of what might work for you or your athletes. I do wanna mention that doing a very low volume of high intensity training or sprint interval training actually did not show a significant effect. 
So if we are very high intensity, but very low in terms of the volume of training, we could also minimize the interference effect potentially by doing that. Okay, let's move on to point number three, and that is fully recover between your endurance training session and your resistance training session by replenishing muscle glycogen. Glycogen is your stored glucose or your stored sugars in your body. So as we do exercise, especially endurance exercise that's very calorically intensive, we're going to deplete our carb storage. By eating fast absorbing carbohydrates and just carbohydrates in general, after doing our endurance training, we can replenish those low glycogen levels and that will help us avoid the interference effect when it comes time to do our resistance training. Specifically, low glycogen levels are associated with higher levels of AMPK, which is that catabolic process that we were talking about. So we wanna replenish our glycogen and try to avoid that as much as possible. If you're on a low calorie diet and you're having trouble replenishing glycogen, this could actually lead to a process of overtraining type symptoms. So in that case, it may actually be beneficial to, while you're in the calorie deficit, stick with more strength training and then whenever you have more calories and you can replenish glycogen more, it may be more beneficial to add endurance training back in at that point. Of course, though, this is an individual decision. You have to think about all the factors involved in your own training or your athlete's training to really decide what's best. And then number four, we have consider performing strength training after low intensity endurance training. And I actually think this is a really, really good way to maximize concurrent training adaptations. If we're doing endurance exercise that's low intensity enough, for example, for most people that works out to around maybe 140 to 145 beats per minute, something like an incline walk or a very light jog, that may actually be a good stimulus to do prior to your strength training session. One quote that I wanna read from one of the research articles is the following. Performing a strength training session immediately after a low intensity endurance session results in a greater stimulus for endurance adaptation than the low intensity endurance session alone. This means that it's actually a positive effect from doing the endurance training session and then doing the strength training session. Again, this has to be low intensity. If you just go run three miles as hard as you can before your strength training session, that's gonna be too intense and it's going to affect your workout. But low intensity cardio, for example, keeping your heart rate under say 150 beats per minute could actually have a positive effect on the endurance gains and not reduce your strength gains. And this is actually a pretty common approach that you'll see bodybuilders do with things like an incline walk. We do wanna make sure that the extra calories that we expend from doing the endurance training do not put us into a calorie deficit and that way affect strength gains. But that's kind of a separate process. And if that's the case, then you just need to get your nutrition down. And it's not the actual training stimulus that would be causing that reduction in gains. So overall takeaway on concurrent training, up to a point, strength and endurance can go well together, but if we're doing too much in terms of the endurance training intensity or volume, then that could start to affect the strength gains. If you wanna learn more on this topic, head to the Movement System Podcast and check out my episode on concurrent training where we actually dive into the numbers of how much hypertrophy we get from a strength training protocol versus a strength training and concurrent training protocol. If you guys do have any questions or suggestions on how you've navigated concurrent training, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. Subscribe so you don't miss any future videos and I will catch you in the next one.